Good morning. It's so good to see everyone today. We just want to celebrate our Lord on this wonderful Lord's Day and give him the praise and the honor and the glory due his wonderful name. So whether you're from Perfala, Georgina, or on other parts of Ontario or around this world, we want to invite you to today's service at Serial Church and say a hearty welcome and a wonderful thank you for staying uh, with us over this time of difficulty, but we know that it's a time that we can serve the Lord. We have two wonderful things coming up today, and that is our guest speaker this morning will be none other than our own wonderful district superintendent, Reverend Steve Otley. He'll be bringing the message this morning, and we have communion, and that'll just be coming up shortly. And so I invite you to get your cracker and your juice ready, and uh, we'll take communion together. God bless you. Have a wonderful morning today. God bless you. Rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. 
Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he also walked the walk. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and I've got this kid in my neighborhood. His name's Jaden, and he's got this dog named Duke. And Jaden, every time we see him, he's always talking about his dog, Duke. He's such an amazing dog, and he's like a super dog, and he's like as big as a car. And he has like a super nose, and he can always find things by smelling them, and he can always, he do all these tricks. Like he can sit, and he can jump, and he can walk on his hind legs, and he can he can do all these things. Just all he's always talking about Duke all the time. This amazing dog, and every time we want to see him, he's like, oh well, he's uh, he's sleeping, or he you know he just won't show us the dog. Well, one day we saw him walking a dog, which was not as big as a car, but was otherwise pretty much how he described him. And, and me and a couple of my friends we were playing out in the neighborhood, and we saw him walking the dog, and we went over to him and we said, hey, Jaden, is that Duke? And he was like, uh, no, this isn't Duke. And we said, his collar says Duke on it. And he was like, oh, uh, yeah, well, I guess that, yeah, this, this is Duke. I forgot, I forgot. Yeah, this is Duke, silly me. And we're like, okay, cool. Can we see something cool from him? Can we see one of the cool things he does? You said he does lots and lots of cool things. And he was like, well, no, I, he's really tired right now. And Duke was not tired. He was like pulling on the leash like as hard as he could trying to get back home. He was trying to walk. And, and Jaden was like pulling on the leash trying to keep him in, in place. And we're like, he's not tired. Just get him, get him to do a trick or something. And Jaden said, uh, okay, well, uh, Duke, walk. And so then he let him walk a little bit. I'm like, no, 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 he's already walking. Do, do a trick. Maybe even something similar, like get him, get him to sit down. And he said, well, uh, okay, Duke, sit. And Duke did not sit. And I think you know how this story ends. Duke was not the amazing super dog that Jaden said that he was. You know, talk is cheap. You can say whatever you want about something or someone, but if they can't actually do the things that you say they can do, then it proves that, that Jaden was lying about this dog, you know what I mean? And here's the thing, is Jaden was claiming all these big things about this dog, and they turned out to not be true. But in the Bible, we see that Jesus made all kinds of really, really big claims too. Like way bigger than anything Jaden did about his dog. Like these, these were crazy, huge things. Like he was saying that he was God's son. And he was telling people that their sins were forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. But he didn't just say these things, he backed them up. Jesus performed all kinds of miracles. And now a miracle is something that happens that really cannot be explained by science at all. And it's not like a magic trick. It's not like something that just like tricks your eyes. This is something that actually happens. And he performed all kinds of miracles. Like he turned water into wine and he helped people who couldn't walk to walk. And he healed people of their diseases and he helped the blind to see. And he walked on water and he calmed the sea. He even raised people back from the dead. And he didn't just raise people back from the dead either. He rose from the dead himself. And all of these things were to prove that he really was who he said he was. He didn't just perform these miracles to look cool. In fact, there were some people who asked for a miraculous sign because they just wanted to see something neat. And he wouldn't do it because that's not what he was performing the miracles for. He wasn't just there to entertain people. He was there to change the world. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would go and look it up. In the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call those the Gospels, they are full of what happened in the life of Jesus and all the many, many miracles that he performed. And actually, it doesn't even have all of the miracles he performed. The Bible says that it would have been impossible to write down every single thing that Jesus did, but he did so many good things for so many people. And through his miracles, he proved that he was the Son of God. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run the things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's 
Welcome. Today is Communion Sunday, and we are going to celebrate the wonderful work of the Lord, and we're going to think about some new things, maybe, hopefully, as we come to Communion. So I invite you to get your cracker and your juice ready. And when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. What a Savior we have. C.H. McIntosh said, There is power in the presence of a risen Savior to solve our difficulties, remove our perplexities, calm our fears, ease our burdens, dry our tears, and meet our every need, tranquilize our minds, and satisfy every craving of our hearts. And he said that somewhere in the 1800s. Friends, this is an amazing thing because we're thinking of the Savior today, the one who was a suffering servant, the one who, who went to Calvary's cross, the one who bore all the burdens of the world, you could say, upon himself and faced the wrath of God for us that we might have life and have it so abundantly. What a wonderful Savior we have. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. Isn't that wonderful? He is the shepherd, the true shepherd, the truest of the truest shepherds to lead and guide us safely beside still waters, to guide us through all the uncertainties in life, even through the valley of the shadow of death. Even there, he will lead us faithfully. Friends, and we can say with David, on the other side of things, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I pray that your prayer today. Something that was rummaging around in my mind lately as we came in to come into communion today was the fact that since Jesus broke bread on this night some 2,000 years ago, it has been faithfully done by churches around the world for some 2,000 years. Isn't that something? That this wonderful uh, ordinance the ordinance, the sacraments, 
that we celebrate and we come around the table and celebrate who Jesus is. We acknowledge his lordship of, the, of, our, of him in our lives. We submit ourselves to him and his wonderful, his wonderful governance. Isn't it wonderful that, that the church faithful has, has partnered with Christ in this for, for some 2,000 years? It is the one lasting legacy as well. I mean, there's baptism and there's many other things. But I was thinking about how wonderful communion is and the fellowship that we can have around the table, celebrating what Jesus Christ has done for us, wonderfully for us. And he did it unselfishly for us. He was the one who went the distance for us. So he's an unparalleled friend, an unparalleled in every way. And so I hope uh, you praise him today and give thanks for your salvation, the work that he's done in your life, and the grace that has been imparted to you. Not just the grace and the salvation, but the mercy that has been extended to us, that we've been justified because of our faith, because of what he has done. So now we take the bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Think of it, my friend. His body was broken for us, that we might have that life and have it more abundantly. Take and eat. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and we praise you for your wonderful work in our lives. But we, th we thank you even more for the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus, who as that wonderful uh, shepherd of the sheep, who as the one that was slain from the foundation of the world, went to the cross and died in our place that we might have life. Father, we give you praise and thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Also on that night, he took the cup and said, This is my blood which is shed for you. Take and drink. Friends, take and drink. We give you thanks again, O oh Lord, for the truth of this wonderful thought that there is life in the blood. Father, we have sung hymns over the years, many, many, many years. There's power in the blood. We thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ, who was sinless and perfect in every way, died for us, but his blood was shed for us on Calvary's cross, providing the atonement for us, that we might have peace with God, that we might have that settlement in our soul before you. And that wonderful day that Jesus gave his life for us, we, Father, we just praise you. We praise you, Father that we have entered into that wonderful covenant, the new covenant with you because of what he has done. We give you praise and celebrate you now and give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful morning. And now we're gonna hear a wonderful message from our DS, Reverend Steve Otto. God bless you. Well, good morning, Cedardale Church family. It is so good to be with you. Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ himself. I so wish that uh, we could be with you today, but it's good to join you virtually. Uh, thank God for technology that allows us to meet like this in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, Pastor Grant and Karen, it is good to be with you. Thank you for allowing me to uh, to share the message this morning with your church family. And uh, I thank God for all that you do uh, for him through the ministry here at Cedardale Church. Pastor Grant, I've been, uh, I've been thinking about how God has been using you to raise up the next generation of ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, you were able to take a couple weeks off uh, recently and um, and some of those who you have been raising up Ben and Steph Stephanie they were able to step to the plate and and bring the messages while you were gone so uh, we praise the Lord for that these have been challenging months haven't they um, and I, I want to commend you Pastor Grant and Karen and church family for your perseverance through these 11 months. Thank you so much for all that you do for the Lord and for the local church here in Pephala. You, I want to remind you that you're not alone. 
There are 60 Nazarene congregations across this Canada Central District, across Ontario. Uh, all kinds of people, all kinds of congregations for all kinds of people, all different sizes. Some meet in the houses, some meet right outside of the pandemic, I mean. Some meet in houses, some meet in schools, some in community centers, movie theaters, uh, church buildings. And, uh, and so you're not alone. And we are but one tribe of many who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we journey this uh, COVID-19 season, uh, I just want to remind you, church, that, that you're not alone. We're together in this. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of the Lenten season on the church calendar today. In fact, it's the third Sunday of Advent, uh, Lent, not Advent, of Lent. <laughs> Advent was back before Christmas, but it's the third Sunday of Lent. And Lent, of course, is the season on the Christian calendar where we, uh, we journey towards the cross. It, it, it leads us to Good Friday when we reflect on Jesus's journey uh, to the cross. And it's somewhat of a solemn season on the calendar. We, uh, we love Easter, right? It's, it's Resurrection Day. It's the day that we celebrate that Christ is risen. But the truth is that resurrection can't happen without a death having occurred first. And in fact, there is the additional piece to that where there is the process of dying. There's the process of dying to self. And this is what the season of Lent helps us to focus in on. Traditionally, uh, Lent, there are three pillars to the Lenten season. The first is prayer, focused times of prayer. And then the second pillar is fasting. Spending time fasting, denying oneself of something so to identify with the sufferings of Christ. There's a powerful uh, verse in the book of Philippians, the New Testament book of Philippians. In fact, it's one of my life verses. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in chapter 3, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of of his resurrection. And then I'm reminded that the verse doesn't end there. Uh, Paul goes on to say, I, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. And so fasting is part of learning how to, uh, how to suffer with Christ, identifying with him, drawing closer to him. So there's prayer, there's fasting. And then the third pillar of the Lenten season is giving, and, and, and giving particularly to those who are in need. Um, some may be familiar with the old phrase, giving alms. And, uh, and, and so that's what the giving in, during the Lenten season is all about. And I cherish uh, Lent as, as I do the other seasons on the Christian calendar. I mentioned Advent by mistake. Uh, earlier, but Advent is another season. Epiphany uh, is uh, the season that follows Christmas. And, uh, and then there's the Easter season, Pentecost, uh, and then Kingdom Tide, or, or uh, the ordinary season on the Christian calendar. And in a world where uh, that is filled with materialism and consumerism, and busyness. These seasons really truly help us to center ourselves in the person of Christ and his journey uh, to the cross, from birth, through his ministry, to the cross. And, and it assists us to uh, cooperate with the Holy Spirit to mature us and to shape us and to, to give us the mind of Christ. In my personal focus this Lenten season, in my prayer and fasting times in particular, is for those who, as of yet, have not crossed the line of faith. They haven't placed their 
faith and trust in Christ. Uh, and I'd like to challenge you to join me there. Uh, I have family members um, who, as of yet, they have not given their lives to Christ. And uh, they're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sure that you do as well. I've got friends and neighbors who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. And I'm sure that you do as well. And so this Lenten season, I invite you to join me in focused prayer and fasting, drawing nearer to the heart of Christ and what his spirit is uh, doing in those individuals, what, what his prevenient grace, the grace that goes ahead, what he is doing in their lives. And my prayer is that he will show me, he will show us where we can join him in his work of reconciliation. Amen? So with that in mind, let's turn to the scripture text that I want to share from this morning. It's in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. But before I read the text, just a little bit of a background for clarity's sake and, and just for context. In the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, in the opening scene, uh, we see John the Baptist um, proclaiming, declaring the coming Messiah. And then we see Jesus coming to where John was baptizing those who had repented from their sins. And, and Jesus had John baptize him in the Jordan River. And, um, and immediately after his baptism, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Remember that? Uh, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, and utilizing scripture, Jesus resists Satan and exit the wilderness journey victorious and empowered by the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry for the next three plus years. And so Jesus begins his ministry of teaching and preaching and healing. And we see, and this is just in chapter one, we see him call his first disciples. Then we see him cast out an evil spirit out of a man. He heals many who are sick and demon-possessed. We see him preaching in his hometown in Galilee. And then he, we see him heal the man with leprosy. And then that's all in chapter 1. And then this is where we pick up the story of the Gospel of Mark in chapter 2 starting at verse 1 down through verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Familiar story in Scripture. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, what, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, he grabbed his mat, and he walked out through the stunned onlookers, they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With this word of the Lord in the forefront of our minds, I want to take us back to that invitation that I extended to you earlier. The invitation to use this Lenten season to pray and fast towards joining the Holy Spirit in the work of reconciliation in the hearts and lives of people around us uh, with the one who created them. And and so with with that in mind, uh, there's a question I want to ask you. It's a question that the Holy Spirit has been having me ask myself. And it's a two-parter, actually. And the first part of that question is this. Are you a help to people in their journey towards Christ? Are you a help to people in their journey towards Christ? Or, second part, or are you a hindrance to people in their journey towards Christ? We see both of these options in play in this gospel story that we just read from the Gospel of Mark, don't we? Uh, We we see the paralyzed man's four friends being a help to him in his journey to Jesus. While the religious leaders of the day, they were trying to hinder his journey to Jesus. So we we see those two options at play in this story that we're told in the Gospel of Mark. You know, over the, over the years, Pat and I have had the opportunity to travel a fair bit. Some of our travels have been for uh, family vacations. Other travels that we've done has been in the capacity of ministry and uh, conferences and, and so forth that we've attended. And so um, one, of the, one of the places, one of the cities that we have visited for, for family vacation mainly Um, over the years is the city of New York, New York City. We have quite a number of family members there and and friends who live in the city, in New York City. It's a fascinating city. If if you've ever been there, you know what I'm uh, I'm talking about. So we spent much time in the Bronx where my family uh, lived over the years, Uh, but we've traveled throughout the city by, by subway, by car, walking a lot. Uh, down in the city there. And I became very intrigued with the many bridges of New York City. Listen to this. New York City has 2,027 bridges. 2,027 bridges. Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, is connected to the other boroughs of New York City and to New Jersey by 21 bridges and tunnels. Absolutely fascinating, these bridges are. 10 of these bridges are are landmarks. Uh, Bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge and the Queensboro Bridge and uh, George Washington Bridge and Manhattan Bridge. These are massive structures. And and what intrigued me the most about these massive structures, which make up the landscape of this beautiful and fascinating city, is the number of people that these bridges um, allow to connect from one part of the city to another. Take the Brooklyn Bridge, for example. It has designated lanes for cars on on the main deck, But then above, there are designated lanes for bicycles and pedestrian. And that one bridge alone, the Brooklyn Bridge, some 105,679 cars cross that bridge every day. That's that's just incredible. That's an incredible number of people. At one time, the Brooklyn Bridge had elevated trains that, that went from one side to the other of the bridge. That's no longer the case, but Manhattan Bridge, which is not too far from it, has uh, four lanes, four subway tracks going across it. It's just amazing. And all connecting people from one place in the city to another place in the city. And as I think about the passage of scripture that we read and the question that I asked, 
uh, am I a help to people in their journey to Jesus? I think to myself, I want my life to be like the Brooklyn Bridge. I want my life to be like the Brooklyn Bridge. This Lenten season, I'm praying that God would continue to mold my life in such a way that it becomes more and more a connector of people to Jesus. I, I want my life to point people to Jesus. Whatever situation, whatever station of life people may find themselves in, I, I want to connect them to Jesus. Some, some may be whipping through life at breakneck speed, you know, so busy with life. Um, and you know, you know those people. In fact, you may be one, but uh, so busy with life, just barreling through life, like the cars flying across the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, others, others may be just leisurely meandering through life, maybe like the bikers going across uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Others, other people that I come across may be people who are economically challenged. They are strapped for cash. There is more month than money <laughs> that the budget can allow for. And, and uh, they don't have money for a car or even a bicycle. So they, they hoof it. They walk everywhere they go. Um, and so I, I want my life to, to be a connector for all kinds of people, people who have all the resources that uh, at their fingertips and people who don't and everyone in between. Lord, give me a great desire and the relevant tools to connect all kinds of people to Jesus. I want to be like the, the, the four friends of the paralyzed man who connected him to Jesus. They were so determined so determined to connect him to Christ that they took him up on the roof. Imagine that, taking him up on the roof of this person's house that Jesus was staying and literally dug a hole in the roof to lower this man down right there in front of Jesus. That's extreme, but, but it shows the, how determined they were, how determined they were to connect him to Jesus. So the question is, are, are, you, are you a connecting bridge for people to experience Christ? Are you a help to people in their journey towards Christ? You know, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in uh, his letter to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. He says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And listen, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, or we are Christ's bridges. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Lord, help us, help me, help you. Help us to be bridges of reconciliation. If, and if ever there was a time where the world needs bridges, it's now, isn't it? It's now. The world need bridges in our society to bridge people from where they are in life to darkness, from darkness into light, into the light of Christ. Amen. Well, another place that Pat and I have visited over the years, another city in the, in the United States, is the city of San Diego, California. Totally different city from New York, but, but just as fascinating, beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, we've traveled there mainly for conferences over the years. And um, several years ago, Pat and I were there for a church planting conference, and we decided that um, after the conference ended on a Friday, we would spend the weekend. We took a couple days off, and we would uh, spend the weekend um, just uh, vacationing and sightseeing and, and so on. And so, uh, so that's what we did. But I have to tell you what happened on the Saturday. 
conference ended on Friday. And Saturday, I had said to Pat earlier in the week, I said, listen, we are, this, we are in San Diego. We are this close to the Mexican border. We just have to go across the border. I mean, I've been to Mexico many times, both of us. We grew up in Belize, Central America, which is bordered on Mexico. So we've been in the southern parts of Mexico. Our honeymoon was in Cancun, so we, but we'd never been to Tijuana. And we'd heard so much about it. I'm going, we, have, we must go see the city. So Saturday morning, we get up and we start. Uh, we, we go to the elevator to go down to our car. And this... This couple joined us on the elevator. It's an older couple. And so uh, the gentleman looked at us and he said, so you can tell how long ago this was, because he said, um, so what are you young folks doing today? <laughs> and I responded and said, well, we're going over to Tijuana. And he says, he looked at me very seriously. He goes, why would you want to do that? <laughs> By this time, we are down in the lobby of the hotel and one of the hotel um, employees overheard what we were saying. And so she comes over and he, she joins the conversation. And she says, you might want to rethink your trip over to Tijuana. This was during the Iraq war. And she said, there are more people killed each day in Tijuana than over in Iraq. And so Pat looks at me and I look at her and we thought, okay, I guess those plans are going out the window. So I drove Pat to the mall and I came back to the hotel and did some things there for a couple hours while she did some shopping. And after a couple hours, I went back and picked her up and I, I had this brilliant idea. I go, Pat, okay, so we can't go across the border. It's too dangerous, but at least we could drive down to the border and I could look across and I could say, I've seen it. I've seen Tijuana. So she agreed. And we, uh, we drove down to the border just a few minutes from where we were. And uh, we parked the car and got out and started walking around. And one of the first things that hits your eyes as you look towards Mexico is the wall. There's a big wall metal slats just separating the two countries and um, it's just it's just an imposing sight as far as you see could see to the right and to the left and there's the border crossing with the cars going across and uh, so we're walking around and pat looks at me and and she says she says you you really want to go across the border don't you i'm going yeah so what we decided to do is that we, we parked the car and we just took our passports and our wallet and a couple other things and uh, we walked across the border. So we, we get in the queue to, uh, at the pedestrian crossing and it was, it was amazing because there were these two huge turnstiles, like metal turnstile. You walk through the first one and you're kind of in no man's land and uh, no one asked us for our passport or questioned us or anything. We walked through the second turnstile and we're in Mexico, we're in Tijuana. We took a cab down to the main street in uh, Tijuana and started walking around. And then we finally found this restaurant, kind of a rooftop restaurant that overlooked the, the street so we could watch Tijuana go by. And uh, we had a meal there texted our kids, hey, guess where we are, kind of thing. And, um, and then the, the longer we were there, the more I could see that Pat is getting uncomfortable. And so finally I said to her, I, you want to go back, don't you? She goes, yes, please, let's go back. So we grabbed the cab and we headed back to, towards the border crossing. This time, a completely different scene there was just this mass of humanity. I mean, there were cars, there were bicycles, there were motorcycles, there were donkey and carts there. I mean, you name it all going north towards the border. And again, there it was the wall, this big wall separating the two countries. And, 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 uh, and this mass of humanity going towards the wall, and then it funnels down into the border crossing. 
this time as we got in the queue to cross uh, at the pedestrian crossing, as easy as it was for us to come from north to south, it was so much more difficult, challenging to go from south to north. I mean, they questioned us. They checked our passport. They checked every ID that we had. Asked us all the questions. Why were you in Mexico? Where are you going? Where do you live? All of, all of the questions that you expect of the border and more. And, uh, and so finally, we, they allowed us to cross back over and we got back to our car and headed back into San Diego. But as I was thinking about that in light of the passage of Scripture that we read and in, in light of the question that I asked, are you a help or are you a hindrance to people getting to Christ on their journey to Christ? I started thinking, I'm going, Lord, this Lenten season, I pray that you would help me not to allow my life to be like that big imposing wall. I am determined that with the help of the Holy Spirit, that my life does not become a stumbling block for others on their way to Jesus. I'm determined that the way I live my life, what I say and what I do and my very attitude will not block people from connecting to Jesus. I don't want to be like the religious leaders in the gospel story who were being a hindrance to the paralyzed man connecting to Christ. If it were up to those religious leaders of the day, this paralyzed man would not have had his, this life-altering, eternal destiny-changing experience. This man would have left that gathering exactly the same way that he came. And so, Lord, help us. Help us. Help us to be bridges of reconciliation. I say it again, if ever there was a time that the world needs bridges, it's now. We need bridges, not walls. You know, the, you know what's most important to note in this story in Mark? The most important thing that happened to this man wasn't that Jesus healed him of his paralysis. Oh, that, that, I mean, that was absolutely amazing what Jesus did. Um, can you imagine being lamed probably from birth back in those days? The only way you can move from one place to another was for others to carry you. There weren't wheelchairs. There weren't some of the accessibility things that we have today for those who have disabilities. In those days, having a disability like this man's meant that life was downright miserable. And so for this man to have Jesus heal him where he was able to get up off his back, roll up his mat, and walk away, this was amazing. But the most important thing wasn't the fact that Jesus healed this man of his paralysis. The most important thing that happened to that man that day were the words that Jesus said to him that we read in verse 5, where Jesus says to him, Jesus saw his faith, and he says to him, My child, your sins are forgiven. My child, your sins are forgiven. Those were far, by far, the greatest words that Jesus could speak to this man. Your sins are forgiven. Those words signaled a changed life. It, it signaled, they, they signaled a changed destiny. They, they signal a life that was transformed, a life that was now reconciled with its Creator, God Almighty. But Jesus, being the compassionate Savior that he is, also turned to the paralyzed man and said to him, Stand up, take up your mat, and go home. 
stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, why in the world would I ever want my life to be a hindrance to someone experiencing that kind of holistic transformation from Jesus Christ? He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's bridges. God is making his appeal through us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us of this scripture today. Thank you for the story of the paralyzed man and his friends who were such a help to him in his journey to Christ. And Father, I pray that you would make us ambassadors of Christ. Shape us, mold us, mold us into bridges, connecting people to Jesus. Lord Jesus, please, please let your perfect love rule in our hearts today. Let us see people for who they are. Let us see people as you see them. Direct our thoughts and our actions and our words and our attitude in a way that will be a blessing to people and a help to them. Jesus, we surrender. I surrender all that I am and all that I have for your purposes in this world and my progress in your grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Through raging storms, you walk on water.